I know we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm going to read to you from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. This real famous portion of Scripture in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, the Bible reads, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. There's a fight going on today. There's a spiritual warfare, a spiritual battle going on, and Satan is our adversary. And we, we know there's a lot of bad things going on in this world. There's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of greed. There's a lot of evil. There's a lot of wickedness. And there's spiritual wickedness in high places. And we know that at the end of the day, the, the, the one who's kind of masterminding all the plots is Satan. At the end of it, you know, there, there's all kinds of wickedness. You know, there's all these secret societies. And people have a tendency to focus on these various groups. But at the end of the day, ultimately, our battle is with Satan. And we need to recognize this. The Bible says it's important. We need to be sober and we need to be vigilant. Vigilant means you're on guard. You're ready. You're aware. You're looking at things that are coming in and you have the right mindset. You have the right worldview. You have the right filter of the information that you come across. Being vigilant, knowing that the devil as a roaring lion, he's walking about just looking to devour people. Just looking to destroy this is a reality. This is what we're looking for. And that's why we need to, the Bible continues, it says, resist steadfast in the faith. We need to stand strong. Why? Because when he comes to attack, the, the, the first reaction might be to want to back up and back off and get away. Right? Which is why we need to resist steadfast and remain standing and stand firm in our faith on God's word. That's why it says, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brother. He's trying to comfort him, saying, you know, the afflictions and persecutions you're going through, that you're facing because you're battling Satan, hey, your brethren are going through the same thing. Take a little bit of comfort in that. Know that it's not just you. And what I'm going to be preaching about this evening is satanic influences. We know that this is a spiritual battle. We look, we look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where we started off there. We're going to start reading again in verse number 12. See, Satan, and people, people have this concept of Satan, Right? In your mind. When you think of the devil or Satan, the majority of people think of a guy, a red guy with horns and a pitchfork. Right? Or they'll think of, you know, Satanists. They'll think of Anton LaVey, maybe. They'll think of, like, you know, that is Satan. And, and you know what? It is, right? To an extent. Not, not the guy with the, the horns and the pitchfork. That, that's, that's not Satan. <laughs> that's just completely unscriptural view. That's just what the world comes up with. But... Anton LaVey, is he a Satanist? Yeah. But that's not the, 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 the way that Satan is going to really come forward with his attacks. It's one way, but that's not going to be the most effective for him, right? Not many people will buy into and subscribe his do-as-thou-wilt philosophy of just everything goes and, uh, and, and just go full-fledged into his satanic Bible and doctrines. Satan's a lot more subtle than that. And we get a glimpse of this here in 2 Corinthians 11. We're going to look at, start reading in verse number 12. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel... For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So the Bible tells us here that Satan himself is transformed into this angel of light. Now, what could be more appealing than looking upon an angel of light? Right? That's going to give you uh, uh, probably confidence if you were to say, wow, look at that, there's an angel of light. That I believe so many people do experience and witness and see these, these, these phenomenon, these events that, that many people claim to have in their life. I don't think it's all just made up. I think people do see lights. I think do, people do see apparitions of different things that, that very possibly and probably are Satan or his minions. And it says here, he's, he's, he's transformed into an angel of light. This is the way he presents himself. This is the way he looks. He's not going to come to you with the pitchfork and horns. He's not going to come to you with the obvious stamp on his forehead just saying, I'm the devil, you know, 
and, and I'm wicked and evil, and, and, but listen to me anyways. Right. He's a deceiver. Right. He's going to come to you and try to gain your confidence in whatever way he can. So it's no surprise that of, of all places that you would think you're going to have the most trust level and the most confidence is going to be in a church setting. It's going to be in a setting where you're trying to hear from God directly because God is the source of all of our truth and wisdom and our knowledge. This God is who we're looking to worship. God is the one that we can trust. So it only makes sense for the ultimate deceiver to try to get himself as close as possible into that position and, and, and try to influence people and steer people away by being as, you know, looking as close and looking as good as he possibly can. No, no con man, no deceiver is going to be successful at their deceit or successful at their con game unless they could build trust, unless they could gain confidence. It's, it's, it's all over if people just walk right up and be like, yeah, I'm not giving you any of my money. You know, people think about, you know, we think about just regular cons on the street. The most successful people are the ones that they come in with their business suit and they, you know, the, the white collar crimes, right? The, the ones that'll, that'll be swindling investors and stuff out of a bunch of money, out of millions of dollars. Why? Because they build up this facade. They build up a, a, a fake history. They build usually a fake name. They build a fake, you know, a fake enterprise. They build all of this stuff as a big show. And they present this evidence and, and, and you know, supposed evidence, not real, it's all phony. It's all fake. It's all a big lie, it's just a big scam, but it's all designed to make themselves look really good and credible in order to gain confidence. And Satan is no different. And one, you know, the, the biggest trick that Satan has is his subtlety and um, being able to influence people on a mass scale, especially these days. And, and we're living in a time right now that is relatively unique in the sense that communication uh, technology has developed so quickly. So there's always been people who have controlled information, right? We know in the dark ages, we know throughout history when, when media has been harder to, to come by, whether it be paper, whether it be ink, whether, you know, whatever the resources are in being able to, to relay information to people. Anytime you have someone in control of that information, You've got a problem when there's this one, one or two people or something in, in control of that and, and you're, you're going to be receiving what they want you to know. Now, we've got good and bad with where we're at right now. There's a mix. The good thing is, is that never before in history has there ever been so much ability to spread information freely with very minimal resources. With, with very small backing, right? Usually people who have a lot of money or big operation, they're able to invest, they're able to spend the money to get the, you know, whether it be a paper, newspaper, print publication, things like that, you know, all of these things cost money. Today with the internet and with the various media forms, I mean, you can create these, these movies, these videos, these, you know, print, whatever, rec audio recordings and get them out and distribute them to a mass number of people. And, but along with that is, You've got the good with the bad. So you've got everybody able to do this. One of the biggest influences today that I believe that is a satanic influence comes to us through media. It comes through the movies, through the music, through the television, even the news, even your nightly news, the, 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 the news broadcasters, all of these, these media, these sources of information are, are a huge influence and Satan has infiltrated these mediums. I'm not saying the medium itself is bad. I'm not saying that, you know, uh, the, the, the technology of a motion picture is evil. I'm not saying the technology of, a, of you know, audio recordings or, or any of this stuff, right? N none of them are inherently bad or wicked or evil. But Satan has definitely gotten involved to use these mediums because they're so effective at teaching and at... Um, Propaganda, mass propaganda. To, to steal a line from Infowars, there is a war on for your mind. This is true. There's a, it's the spiritual battle in the Bible, but there really is a war of, of ideas. There's a war of, of, of righteousness versus wickedness. There's a war of, of biblical truth versus everything else, which is versus world religion, versus Balaam, versus satanic religions. There's always been this going on. 
and, and it's a struggle. And, and because it's a spiritual war, we're not fighting this with swords and guns and, and shields and stuff. It's, it's with words. And it's with ideas and actions. So, um, unfortunately, though, the, I believe is with Infowars is that they, uh, you know, they've abandoned their integrity and are pretty much propagandists at this point. They're just, they've gone beyond their, their um, what they originally stood for, it seems to me, and just become a, a, a mouthpiece for our current president. But that aside, that's not really that, even that important what we are seeing, though, and that is, that is one element of what we're seeing, is just propaganda in general. You, you can see this, if you could take a step back, when you're looking at, at various outlets of information, right? No matter where it's coming from, if you're able to, to, to get a little higher level view and see what are they pushing out every day, is it propaganda or is it truly, are they truly interested just in information? Are they using fear-mongering and scare tactics and every single day there's a new red alert and everything is about to end and the sky is falling, right? Or is it people who are just interested in information? Now, no matter who you are, no matter what organization you're, in, you're, you're part of or not a part of, all of us are going to be, whatever is even considered to be newsworthy is up to your opinion. It's up to your worldview. It's up to the, the way that you perceive the world, right? Some things that happen, you may not even consider to be newsworthy. Someone else might be based on their understanding of the world and what they think is important. So there's always going to be a bias coming through no matter what, no matter what. But there's a difference between the natural bias that we all have and a very strong concerted effort to push a particular narrative because that's just what you believe in, right? Now, obviously, when you come to church here, you are going to hear a narrative that has to do with Scripture, that has to do with the Bible. And I, I would think that would be obvious coming to a church, right? That this is where we're coming from, that it's the standpoint that this is true. So the worldview is this is the truth, and we're going to preach this book and apply it to the, to the rest of the world in light of this truth. And... Um, but that's not the way that we receive the rest of our worldly information, if you call it the news or anything like that. The vast majority of people, they don't have that view. So they're going to be coming from a different angle. But um, anyways, I don't want to get too far off on that either. What my point is, is we're supposed to be vigilant and on the lookout for satanic influences. And one of those influences is through propaganda. It's through this uh, instrument of, of hammering down a certain point to the, to, to the point where you might not believe it the first time, or the second time, or the third time, but they'll keep on hitting and hitting and hitting a point to get you to, to start to, to consider or change your mind or just to, to back off a little bit on what you know to be true. Because you, if you hear something often enough, what was it? there was a famous quote from Hitler, and I'm totally going to butch it, but it's like, um, talking about if you, if you tell people paradise is in hell or something like that, like the, the often enough, they'll believe it. If you a lie often enough, people will believe it, Right? And, um, and, and I, t I don't remember the quote, but um, it's true. If you repeat something over and over and over and over and over again, in general, a mass amount of people will start to just accept it as being true. Oh, yeah, I've heard that before. You hear it once here, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's not true. Then you hear it again over here. No, 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 that's not true. Then you hear it again, maybe from a third source. And even without having any of your own, you know, information, you, you'll, you'll stop resisting or challenging what you're hearing because if you hear it from, especially from multiple times and from multiple sources, you'll just start to accept it as, well, maybe this is true. And, and that's the way that propaganda works, is that they try to influence mass opinion by hammering it um, down, but it happens over, it, it happens relatively gradually. It's not something that happens overnight. Now, what we have today is a very few amount of people who are controlling the narrative. And this is important to recognize also because even with the independent media that we have and, and this ability with the internet and so many people out there that could, that could report news and, and that could provide information and everything else, you'll notice that people are still talking about the same things. Why is that? Why is it that there, there, are, there are certain stories that just 
This is what everybody's talking about. And many times, it's something stupid. It's something that doesn't really mean that much. It's, it you know, has to do with entertainment or has to do with something else. But you'll get, even these independent sources that have nothing to do with it, you know, it, it's one thing to see it coming from the CNNs and the MSNBCs and the Fox News, you know, these big corporations, these big media outlets that have billions of dollars that are owned by just a, you know, a, a relatively very small number of, uh, of people at the top that are operating these news organizations. It's one thing to see it from them, but see, they still have, a, even though a lot of people are kind of distancing themselves from those, those organizations, they're still controlling the narratives. They're still controlling the talking points. And um, we need to be aware of that. And, and, and to the sense that we're not getting caught up in these distractions from the real issue, because even the narratives themselves will help to change your opinion on things without you even realizing it. So Satan uses his false prophets to control the narratives in churchianity. He uses the big names in, 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 in you know, Christianity today or churchianity to do this. And subtlety is how the deception works. The closer he can make something look to the truth, the more believable it is. That's the way he operates. But my, my example of this, so we're talking about you know, controlled narratives and controlled talking points and, and, and how does that impact your own thought process. Here, here's an example of that. When you're arguing over what trimester is unacceptable for abortions, you've already lost. They got you on the wrong thing. And, and, and you've already unwittingly just given up the right stand and, and, are, and are thinking about something that should never even come to that point. It doesn't even matter. Another example is when you're debating whether to bake a cake or to perform a sodomite marriage, you're, you're already way beyond the point. That the, it's, it's meaningless. It's stupid. It's a waste of time. Those aren't things that we ought to be focused on. We've already lost. I mean, the real issue in both of those is, well, do you still believe murder is murder? You, it, it, unless, unless you're arguing that no trimester is acceptable, that no abortion is acceptable, then you've already lost. If you're going to start just, just quibbling over a day, of murders acceptable up to this point. If you're going to start saying that, oh, well, you know, we're tolerant and accepting and, and you can do whatever you want, you can be a sodomite, um, but, but I'm not, I'm not going to perform that marriage ceremony for you. We've already lost. I mean, the Bible says it's a capital crime. It deserves a death penalty. So if you're going to hold to a certain standard, and if this is your standard, we need to be careful not to get shifted in the debate and start thinking about just stupid things because who cares? Who cares about, about the marriage or the cake or the, you know, what, what trimester and, and quibble over all that stuff? Let's just stand firm on what's right. But see, what happens is they, they get you to shift a little bit. And again, it happens almost unwittingly because you start getting focused on these other fine points that should never even come to that. Doesn't even matter. You're spinning your wheels and you're wasting your time. It's a real simple illustration. And, and we need this from time to time. And I know, look, what I'm preaching tonight isn't anything earth-shattering or new. What it is is a reminder. It's a reminder of the influences that affect us in this world on a daily basis because this is a, a slow process of, of being manipulated be even being brainwashed to accept certain things and become tolerant of sins. If you take a step back and think back, because most people in here are decades old, okay? I'm going to be 40 this year. I remember when I was growing up, it was not a big deal at all for you to hear someone being called a faggot unless you were the one that was being called the fag. Then you got a problem with that, right? But no one cared. Like, literally, I, I was growing up, and it was something that, you know, just like you, 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 you rip on your friends and you call names or whatever. And I'm not saying that just doing a bunch of name calling is right. right? Obviously, you shouldn't just be calling each other names. But kids do that all the time. But no one would bat an eye, right? Who cares? Not a big deal. You're not worried about offending a sodomite. Why? Because the culture was different back then, because the culture then was a lot less tolerant 
of extreme perversion and wickedness and just total depraved things. Because people back then, it, who cares? It's like saying, why would you care about the feelings of calling someone a name that's a, that's a child molester or a serial killer or a rapist? Like, why do you care about their feelings? When they do such wicked, horrific acts, why would you even care? But these days we're being taught to be, oh, no, 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 you, you, know, you, can't, you can't say those things because you're going to offend somebody. But I'm sorry, that th this is a result of brainwashing. There was simply back then a more of a hatred, yes, that's the right word, a hatred for perversion and wickedness in the previous generations. It was not acceptable. It was not tolerated. Why has this changed? Are we all of a sudden so much more evolved as a human race or more enlightened? That's what the liberal talking points are going to get you to think. That's what they oh, We are so much smarter. This is the pride and vanity of man. Can I tell you, we are so much smarter now than we've ever been in history. And we are just. I mean, we are at the pinnacle of the human existence as far as how brilliant we are and how smart we are and how evolved we are and becoming tolerant of all of this wickedness and perversion is actually a really good thing. But the truth of the matter is, this has been happening throughout history and literally in cycles as nations have gotten wealthy and powerful and, and, and encompass more and have gotten great technologies and advances in their own right and then get into decadence and sin and wickedness and filth and perversion. They exalt those things as being good. Everything gets turned on its head. Good becomes evil, evil becomes good. This is not new. This isn't a result of, of us becoming so much smarter and enlightened and, and, and the virtue of this tolerance. Tolerating sin is not a virtue. I'm sorry. God is not tolerant of sin. Actually, God created a place called hell that's burning with fire and brimstone in the middle of the earth right now because of sin. That's how tolerant the Lord is of sin. Do you really think after thousands of years of human existence that we are now just leaps and bounds ahead in our thinking in just a matter of decades? Just a matter of decades, right? I mean, 30 years ago, what I was just talking about, fine, acceptable, the norm, right, to, 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 to have a hatred for the wicked perversion, for the sodomite. But now all of a sudden, no, 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 you can't even say that. You need to be tolerant. You need to be accepted. You need to be loving. You need to, to embrace this and say it's just fine. After thousands of years now, in the past 30 years, we've just, whew, man, we are just, we've got it. No, it's already been. There's nothing new under the sun. This point of view has already been around. And you're foolish to think that this is something brand new and, and you're so, so cool and unique to, to have this type of an attitude towards filthy sodomites. But that's what you're led to believe. I saw a home video recently. We just got out the, this VHS tape from um, 2001. And, uh, and it's just one of my, my personal home videos my parents sent me when I, was, when I just moved here. And um, in the, in the it was a pretty boring video, but in the video there was... Uh, Teletubbies on the TV. And a comment was made, well, which one's the gay one? Right? Now, I, I don't like the word gay because gay means happy, whatever. But, but that was a comment that was made. No one said anything. Wasn't a big deal, right? It was said in jest. And it, because at that time in 2001, sodomites were looked on as gay and, just, and funny and, and just a big joke, right? But that's how they got you to start tolerating their sin. Because at first it's filthy and wicked and you don't even want to look at it or think about it. But then they start introducing it through the media, through the movies, through the TV shows especially, that we're going to have this flamboyant character 
And they're just going to be ridiculed and kind of a laughing stock on our show, on our program. And we're going to get you to laugh at their perverted, you know, their perversion and their wickedness and, and just, oh, yeah, they're acting kind of, kind of effeminate. And that's funny, right? And they portray it in a way that's just real funny. Because when you can laugh about things, especially something like that, that will make you more tolerant. That will make you a little bit more embracing of it. Yeah, yeah, for a while, see, but it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop at just being a joke. That's just how they open up the door. That's just how Satan got his foot in the door to, to say, to get you to, to start to be more comfortable just with, their, with, just with them being around. Yeah, they're, they're in the shows, but, but yeah, we're just kind of mocking them. We're just kind of making fun of them. After a while, though, now you're going to be given the guilt trip for mocking and making fun of. Then they start pushing the envelope and they're going to start showing you, hey, this is what we do. They're going to show you the kisses. They're going to show you the embraces. They're going to show you the things that's going to make your stomach turn in order to desensitize you and continue to do it and do it and do it to, to the point to where you've just been influenced and brainwashed by this satanic agenda of getting you to accept wickedness. Now, the normalization of sin through exposure and the deceitfulness of, of movies, this is, this is how it happens. It's through, you know, all, for all, all movies are fake. We know that, right? Like, like, they do a very good job of mimicking reality, right? They want you to think that the image you're watching on, on the TV screen is real, they, they, it's so good now. I mean, literally, they could, it, could, it could absorb you. you. You get absorbed into the story, into what you're watching. The images are being flashed in your head. The sounds that you're hearing, you could literally feel like you're there. They're very good at what they do in making it seem real. But it's all fake. <laughs> it's all, th those people aren't the real people. They're just some actors. They're playing a part. They record over and over and over and over and over and over and over again to get whatever they want to get exactly like that in front of you. They get to pick the scene. They, it's not a real situation. It's not a real home. It's not, it has nothing to do with reality. They're creating their own reality illusion to put in front of you. But those aren't what you're thinking about when you're just absorbing and watching the, the, the TV, when you're just watching the movie. You don't think about that for a second. Why? Because they're so good at their illusion. They make you think this is a regular house. And everything's just fine. Here's my gay friend, and there's nothing wrong with them. They're just fine. And they're just like everybody else. They're just a little bit misunderstood. That's the reality they want to project to you. But they're not, what, they're, what they're missing is all the attributes that's found in Romans chapter 1. Full of all unrighteousness, wickedness, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, all the things that go along with that, they don't show you those parts because they don't want you to see those parts because they don't want you to abhor that which is evil. Don't forget, Satan is an illusion artist going all the way back from the Garden of Eden and deceiving Eve into... into Wanting and coveting the forbidden fruit that before his influence, she didn't even really think about it. She didn't even care. It was just there. Okay, yeah, we can't do that. Fine. I won't, I won't, I won't eat of that. Until Satan brings it up. He points it out to her. Hey, that's a, it's a pretty, pretty good looking fruit there, right? You know, you know, God didn't tell you, but you know, when you eat that, you're going to be like God yourself and starts, and starts feeding all this information and, um, and ultimately gets her to commit sin. And what did he do? He created an illusion. He created a facade. And, and, and shed his own darkness on the situation. It's not light. It's darkness. From the Garden of Eden all the way up through the temptations of Christ, what did he do? He showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. Right? He, show, he showed it to him. All of this to build it up, right? These, look at these magnificent kingdoms of this world. These can all be yours. I'll give them all to you because I've got that power. I give it all to you. You just fall down and worship me. What are the consequences of that, though? Obviously, it's a big, big fat lie and, and just 
a big um, illusion to try to make sin appear appealing, to make it look, hey, this is really good. I, I actually want this. I, I, you know, and and you, you go into something like that without thinking about the consequences. Now, obviously, Jesus Christ didn't commit sin and he wasn't fooled by that. But all too often, people today are fooled by the great illusion. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter number 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Satanic influences. Satan is a liar and he's very good at making sin appear appealing. 2 Peter chapter 2, of course, deals with the false prophet. 2 Peter 2 and Jude are parallel passages, both dealing with false prophets. As our main text in 2 Corinthians 11 also dealt with the false prophets, Satan, you know, making himself look like a minister of light, like an angel of light, and his ministers like ministers of light, right? That, that this is their appearance. But they teach lies. They teach falsehoods. 2 Peter 2, jump down to verse 17. We're going to read a few verses here, and then we're going to jump up to verse 12. Verse 17 in 2 Peter 2 says, These are wells without water. Clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. A well without water is, essentially, it's like an illusion. You can look at it from the outside. You see, oh man, there's a well. I'm thirsty. I'm going to go over there. Oh wait, there's no water in there. They're empty. And that's what the false prophet is anyways. They're empty on the inside. Look at verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh. This is the way they try to deceive you and trick you. They try to appeal to your flesh. They try to make things look really good. They use these great swelling words of vanity. Vanity means they're empty. They're meaningless. There's nothing to it. But they make it look like there's a lot there. They're swelling words. Man, this is great. They allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty... They themselves are the servants of corruption for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. They promise liberty, but they can't deliver on that. They're all, they themselves are already in bondage and they're trying to make you think, oh yeah, get involved in all this sin. It's going to be great. We speak these great swelling words. This is awesome. Come and, come and be a part of this with us. You'll be free, man. You'll be free. Bring you into bondage. Reminds me of, you know, the, 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 the drug dealer. Oh, man, free your mind. Take some of this. Take a trip, man. Take some of this acid. Take some of these mushrooms, man. You got to free your mind. You'll be free as they bring you into bondage. And it's just a big stinking lie. Atheists call themselves free thinkers. <laughs> there you go. It's a perfect example. The, the free thinking, meaning... Free from reality and free from the truth and free from the existence of God is what they want to be. It doesn't change reality, though. Jump up to verse number 12. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 12. We get a little bit more context for who we're talking about here. I think most of you already know, are familiar with the chapter, but verse number 12 says, But these as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed... Well, that's not a very nice thing to say. These people are stupid animals that are made to be taken and destroyed. Well, that's what the Bible says. They speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. Look at this next part. Beguiling unstable souls. In heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children who have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the, pro of the prophet. We need to be sober. We need to be vigilant because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The devil has his ministers that look like ministers of light, but they're really false prophets. We get an example and a description and, and characteristics of these false prophets 
in 2 Peter chapter 2 as being natural brute beasts. And one of the things they do, the Bible says they beguile unstable souls. Unstable can mean a lot of things. I mean, literally, it means you're not stable. You're not founded. You're not grounded, right? There's a few different people that can be unstable. One of which can be someone who's maybe a new believer. Another one could be someone who's just maybe very mentally unstable. Another one, though, is children. Children are unstable. They still have a lot to learn. They still don't have a lot of world experience. They still need to just get a lot of knowledge. They need to grow. They need to learn. They are unstable. That is why it's, it's relatively easy in general for predators to pick up children because they could be deceived so easily. You, 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 I remember when I was growing up and it's still today, you know, don't ever take candy from a stranger, right? Why? Because for a child, for a kid, hey, do, do you want a candy bar? Because their worldview, they're thinking everything's been great. I don't need to worry about anyone because no one's ever harmed me before. All they ever know is that people are good. I grew up with mom and dad. They're good. I've got my family. They're good. I've got some friends. They're all good. And here's this nice man wanting to give me a candy bar. Right? Mm -hmm. But the naivety, the lack of wisdom, the lack of judgment, they're unstable, leads them into danger. Where, oh, okay, yeah, well, come on. Again. Oh, I'll give you a ride home. Never see from him again. It happens all too often by the predators and the perverts. These are the unstable souls that I believe are being warned about, but this is what I'm going to talk about anyways. Uh, I mean, you, you want to apply that to another unstable soul, fine. But we're talking about tonight satanic influences, and now I want to call your attention to being vigilant about the satanic influences on our children. One of those things, you know, the, the, the main influence that is out there is media, it's you know, movies, music, television, that type of thing. It is the most powerful one. It's not the only influence, but this flow of information, I mean, it's extremely powerful and it's doing the most damage. And that's why I'm just primarily focused on this type of influence tonight. And I'm going to get even more specific. And when it comes to our children, one of those influences, uh, literally a satanic influence that's dressed up to look really good and really nice and, and completely harmless is Disney movies. Disney movies. Right. So what? Dis what are you talking about? Disney movies? What do you mean? How could how could that be? Well, I mean, come on. I saw Disney movies as a kid. What are you talking about? It's wicked as hell. Yep. But see, most people need to have it pointed out to them because you got the blinders on, and many people have just been brought up with this, thinking that oh well, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. I, I you know I grew up with that, and and I'm just fine. But when you look at the actual content, first of all, first of all, turn if you would to Deuteronomy chapter 18. First and foremost, when it comes to Disney, you'll be hard pressed to find any Disney movie. And when I'm talking about Disney, I know they're huge and they have what I mean, however many billions of movies or whatever out there they produce. We're talking about the ones that everybody knows. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not saying any of them are good. But of all of their hits, their classics, all the popular ones they have, right? The ones that are geared for the children and have been around for a long time, they pretty much all have witchcraft in them. Right. Every single one is magic. It's fairy godmothers. It's fairies. It's this magic. It's that magic. Look at Deuteronomy 18, verse number 10. Deuteronomy 18, 10. And this has been pushed so hard in all of those movies, it's going to make your kids think it's not that big of a deal. It's just magic. It's fine. But this is good magic. I mean, there's this fairy godmother, right? I mean, she did good things. And they try to spin it and make it look like it's in a good light. And you say, oh, what's the big deal? What's, uh, it's just make-believe. They know it's not real. What's the big deal, Pastor Burns? Why, why are you making such a big issue out of this? Well, let's see what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number 10. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. 
I think that pretty much covers a list of, of, of these type of, of wizards and, and witches and magic and everything else that you could possibly think of. I mean, what other name is there that you're going to use? I don't think there were any more names in the 1600s. When, when this was trying to I mean, he pretty much covers everything. He says, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. God cast, he, he said, my people, children of Israel, I'm going to bring you into a place and you're going to be my people and you're going to be holy. And you're going to be a peculiar people. And in order for me to do that, these people got to go. The wizards, the witches, the magic, the witchcraft, it's all got to go. I don't want that around you. I don't want that influencing you. They're going to be gone. The Bible says, I shall not suffer a witch to live in Exodus. So yeah, this is why it's a big deal. Because God says it's such a big deal. It's an abomination. I mean, he hates it. There's a hatred. There's a strong hatred for these things. So much to the point where he says, Death penalty. Death penalty. God's not playing around with the witchcraft. You may think it's not a big deal, but God thinks it is. And when you got the unstable souls now getting programmed in their head that every time, oh, these Disney movies, they're great, man. My kids love them. Every single time they're seeing witchcraft being used positively, used in a good way. Oh, no, this is good. Oh, yeah, this happens. Like, this is a normal thing. It's an everyday thing. And I mean, you go through going all the way back to Snow White. Remember, there's a witch. Mirror, mirror on the wall, right? That's the witch of the Snow White. Unfortunately, I've been corrupted with this stuff, but I know what it is. And, now, and, and what does she do? She eats an apple, right? The forbidden fruit, if you will. But what happens? Does she die? No, she just goes into this soul sleep. It's not even real death. She goes into the soul sleep. She's cursed until some guy comes along and kisses her supposedly dead body. Which, that's a little weird in itself anyways. <laughs> like, what's this guy doing kissing some dead body? That's and she was supposed to have been dead for like years too. Like, I don't remember the story. I don't remember all the details of it. So, but like, she was supposed to be dead for a long time. And instead of burying her, they kept her in this glass case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, a, I'm not even going to get into that. The dead body stuff, but that's not the only time something like that is even in these Disney movies. You got Fantasia, where Mickey Mouse was a big sorcerer, right? And that won awards. I mean, that was, that was big out in the world. And what is he? He's got his Merlin hat, his wizard hat on. He's got his magic wand. And what is he doing? Casting spells. I mean, total wizard. That's not even subtle. That's just, here's a wizard, and this is a good thing, and we're going to put some nice music to it. To, to make it more palatable, to make it not seem as evil and wicked because it just sounds real nice. And he's doing these fancy little, little cartoon animations across the screen to make you think that it's all just fun in games. You got Pinocchio. Pinocchio is another, I mean, you talk about, and I, I could, I was trying to look up a little bit about that because it's been so long since I've seen that. But I remember there's a point where they went to this to this island and they were all like drinking and smoking and gambling right. and, and they start turning into jackasses. It's, you know, it's just like, what, what in the world are you putting for this kid? And one of the clips I saw last night was, because uh, I was looking at this, and one of the guys who was like the mastermind behind all this stuff looked like a total pedophile. I mean, I hadn't seen this movie, in, I mean, in, in so long. And, and looking at it now, I'm just like, wow, that guy is like, total creep pedophile luring these kids in and stuff. It's like, what, what do you even make, you know, having these kids watch? And you got Jiminy Cricket and he's supposed to be his conscience and all this other, you know, it's, just, it's still a bunch of magic. And they try to play it as, oh, there's good values in this. But their values are all twisted when, when you compare them to the Bible. There's, there's, of course, they're going to have some good things, right? I mean, they're going to say, well, the point of this was to show you that, you know, the drinking alcohol and, and everything, that was, that was bad, right? These are, these are bad things. But the overarching themes was, he was, Pinocchio was reborn as a boy because of how good he was.
ultimately, because you made the right decisions, because you were selfless and you, you helped people out in the end. You made a lot of mistakes, but, but you ended up doing good. So now you're going to get a rebirth. And that is the overarching theme of the movie. It was based on how good he was and, and how sincere his heart was. False gospel. False gospel. They're full of them. You've got Alice in Wonderland. is another Disney movie. We don't even have to go into the glorification of the drugs that's found in that movie. I mean, if you've ever seen that, I mean, you've got to practically be on drugs even. You know, it's... it's, it's Craziness. I'm not even going to get into that very much. You've got Peter Pan, which I still don't know. Is Peter Pan a boy or a girl? Don't know. It's like some it. It's some transgender thing. I think it's supposed to be a boy because his name's Peter, right? But don't know. I mean, it's just weird. Is it half half? It's like some. Oh, was it a hybrid? The original one, but not the cartoon one. The cartoon one is like some... Oh, yeah, yeah, I know the pan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The flute and the, and the yeah, and the, myth, the, the mythology, the, well, which is really a devil, right? And Lewis Carroll was a pedophile. The guy who wrote Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. This is the source. Yeah. This is the source. I didn't even know that. Yeah. Lewis Carroll, a pedophile. That's, no, that's, that's good information. So Alice was an, a real girl that, that was his muse, that was his, his, his um, inspiration for the story that some pedophile lusted after or whatever was infatuated with and created this story. And we're going to show that story to our kids. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great influence. Go Disney. <laughs> You got Peter Pan with, the, with the, the, the acceptance of transgenderism just all going all the way back to, to Peter Pan, boy, girl, who knows. You got the Little Mermaid, of course, and, and, and you start mixing all these animals with humans and stuff, right? The, the fish mixed with a, with a person, and then all of the magic and witchcraft, and you've got your Zeus character in there, right, supporting more false gods and, and, um, and, and false religion. You've got Aladdin... Right? With your genie and more magic. And, and, you know, again, the same thing with the witchcraft. You've got the Lion King with the soundtrack done by the sodomite Elton John. And, and starting to push all of the, uh, the, uh, um, what the eco, the, the climate people, the, 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 the planet lover, the, the tree huggers, right? Um, as part of that agenda. And then, not only you have all that, you have the subliminal message messages, because the, the majority of these graphic artists and designers, and I don't want to say the majority in, in just, in general, the entire industry, but at Disney, you're going to find that a lot of them are these sodomites. A lot of them are already queer, and they go through, and, and they get these jobs here at Disney, and what they do is they insert their own perversions into these movies. And they create these subliminal messages. And if you think I'm crazy or something, oh, that's not, yes, it is true. I had one copy of a VHS that had a phallic symbol on the front of The Little Mermaid. I mean, it was unmistakable. There's no way that you could, you could mistake that. There's, there's movies you could hit pause and you could see words like S-E-X and, and other things like that just riddled throughout these various movies. That's a fact. I've seen it with my own eyes. Not doctored, not edited, original movies with all this stuff built in there. Oh, well, who cares? Well, you're just making nothing, something out of nothing. Why is it there? Why is it there? Right. You got the mixing of the hybrid humans and animals, and which brings me to Beauty and the Beast. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus 18. And to be honest with you, this is ultimately what kind of prompted the idea for the sermon tonight on the satanic influences is because now, supposedly, there's this new Beauty and the Beast movie, right? Because they're always, re I mean, they can never come up with their own movies anymore anyways. Everything's a remake of something that's already been done. It's already been done. Um, but they, they have this, there's this big firestorm, I guess, online. This is how I even heard about it, about this, this new Beauty and the Beast movie. 
and everybody's up in arms because they finally came out with it and were forthright of bringing some sodomite characters right into the movie. And I believe they actually have some, some scene where they're like kissing or embracing or something like that. And this is supposed to be a kid's movie. Now, what's funny is that the, the, the shock that some people have over this movie and that scene. Is it really that big of a surprise that they're doing this? I mean, have you not seen the writing on the wall? Have you not already seen the, the, the homo characters that they've already introduced just without telling you and just putting it right up in your face? No, you haven't because you've been brainwashed by the world, because you've been watching the television too much, you've been watching the television, and you've been getting pumped in with the world's nonsense, with the satanic view that this is all okay. And you've been allowing that to come in and, and moderate your thinking. You've been allowing that to influence your mind and not spending enough time in this book, which is going to tell you to abhor that which is evil, which is strong hatred, abhor it, Stay far away from it. Have nothing to do with it. And you've been indulging yourself, indulging your flesh, and allowing whatever to come into your mind. And you see things over and over and over again. Pretty much your guard goes down after a while. Guard starts to go down. I've heard this over and over again. You're desensitized to it. Because think about it. Abhor is a strong hatred, right? If we're supposed to abhor things, I mean, when's the last time you felt just a strong desire, a strong, man, I hate that. A lot of people don't even have that anymore. And the Bible says we're supposed to abhor that which is evil. The problem is what happens is that people will get that, that, that understanding, they'll get that reaction for a little while, but the more you continue to see the same thing that once you abhorred, the harder it is to, to continue along that same line of thinking when you're, allow, when you're willingly allowing this to come into your mind. It's different when, when, this, when you're confronted with it and you don't want to see it. It's different when you're avoiding it at all costs. But when you're sitting down, you're getting your tub of popcorn, you're turning the lights down, and you're clicking on that, that TV screen, and you're putting that movie in or whatever, downloading it, now you're saying, I'm choosing to, to watch whatever I'm putting in here. And the more you do that, and the more you've done that over the past you know, the 20 years, the more you've been programmed to accept where we're finally at today. And they always got to push the envelope a little bit more and push a little more, and they'll backtrack a little bit. But then they're going to push it even farther next time. And that's just the natural progression of things. But look at, you're in Leviticus 18, look at verse number 22. Because mind you, and it's not a big surprise that they chose beauty and the beast to have this sodomite scene in anyways. Think about how perverted the story of beauty and the beast is anyways. You've got a half man, half animal creature that looks like a big dog. And this princess. And this princess falls in love with an animal to the point to where she kisses him. And it's always this kiss, right? Why does it always have to be this kiss? They have to get physical and have this kiss and then all of a sudden he transforms and turns into this human, right? How bizarre is that? I mean, does anyone here think that that's normal to come up with some story? I mean, people just push it off like, oh, but it's a classic. Why? Why is it a classic? It's like people who think Halloween is normal. Well, it's been going on for all these years. I did it when I was a kid. Why is it normal to put pictures of skeletons and witches up in front of your house? Why? It's weird. It's not normal. It's been normalized. But for you to be a Christian and say, this is where I get my truth from and this is where the light is, to just accept that stuff, you need to take a second look, my friends. I don't care how many times you've seen it as a kid. I saw it as a kid a bunch of times. 
I was stupid. I didn't have the truth. I didn't understand. I was ignorant. But now I know better, which is why my kids never watch this trash. Leviticus 18.22, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Again, another abomination in the Bible. Called out by name as being extremely hated by God. As are the wizards and the necromancers and the astrologers and prognosticators and all those other people. Neither, look at, and then it follows up in verse 23. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. No coincidence that they put the sodomite, the homosexual, right next to the, to the bestiality. Because if you're, all, if you're depraved enough to, to, to have relations like the, of that nature with the same gender, the only thing that's left is animals or children. I mean, that, what, what else is there? I mean, you, you've already hit the bottom. There's like nowhere left to go. It's disgusting. Leviticus chapter 20. Go a couple chapters over. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination that shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. So not only is it an abomination, it's an abomination worthy of death, just like the wizards. And if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire, both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall slay the beast. He's like, I don't even want the animal to live. And that's just weird. You kill the man, and you kill the beast. Verse 16, And if a woman approach unto any beast and lie down there too, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And then, of course, at, near the end of that chapter, verse 27, says, A man also or a woman that hath a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. You say, I've never understood. How can people even get to that point of animals? That's weird. I mean, I mean who, who would ever even come up with something like that? If you're asking that question, I sure hope you're not putting beauty and the beast in front of your child and wondering how anything like this could possibly happen. As you're showing your children, here's a story of a beautiful princess kissing a dog man. The kids like that. They think that's funny. <laughs> it's no surprise. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter, we're almost done. Romans chapter 12. People are getting so upset about, about the Disney movie now with, their, with the, oh, they're pushing homosexuality on my kids. Why are you showing your kids any of these movies to begin with? Because you've been desensitized to all this other wickedness and you didn't even realize it. Because you're not spending enough time in God's word and getting his perspective on things. You've spent too much time letting the world influence you with their perspective on what's right and what's wrong. That's the problem. And you're probably going to some church where, where nobody's calling it out and naming and, 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 and saying it like it is and putting it in light of the scripture. Because these, these passages that we read, some of them are from the Old Testament and no one ever reads the Old Testament anymore. No one thinks that's, that's material, that, that it applies to us today. When the Old Testament is we're going to find uh, you shouldn't have a man and an animal lying down together. Shouldn't be pertinent today, but unfortunately it is. Because the wickedness of man is great. Look at Romans chapter 12. And this is what I've been bringing up repetitively throughout the sermon. Romans 12, 9. Let love be without dissimulation. So your love needs to be not fake. It needs to be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. So in order to have love that's without dissimulation, you need to hate that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. New Testament. Somewhere along the way, people go soft on sin and forget that we are supposed to Abhor it. Abhor is a strong word. 
It's not, it doesn't even just say hate. Abhor is stronger than just and hatred. And hatred is strong. Hate is a strong word to use. Abhor is extreme hatred. I mean, that is, in the English language, you don't really get much stronger than that as far as the feeling that you're supposed to have towards evil. And these movies are full of evil. They're full of wickedness. We need to hate that and not allow that to come in and influence our minds. Jump up to verse number 1 in Romans chapter 12. Verse number one, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The Bible is teaching us not to be conformed to this world. The world loves Disney. That's why you have Disneyland. That's why you have Disney World. That's why these movies have made who knows how much money. I don't even know. I can't even speculate. That's why it's in literally almost every single home in America. Probably multiple copies even. They come out with all their classic editions and this edition, that edition, and people buy it up. The world loves this stuff. But listen, Christian, the Bible says don't be conformed to this world. Don't be like them. You shouldn't have the same entertainment that the world is. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have the same things that brings you, you know, the, the, that you're going to spend all your time in. Is this the way that they spend their time? We need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. How are we going to renew our mind? Right here. We have a lot of influences coming at us all the time from all over the place. We need to continually renew our mind. Get it back right. I got, oh man, I've got distracted. I, I got off course. I, I got, I, I let, like at least various things are just coming at me from all angles. I need to renew my mind. I need to renew, renew my mind in order to prove what is good, what is acceptable, and what is the perfect will of God. Does God want my children to watch this stuff? Is that what God wants when he's just got done telling me how abominable these things are? Does he want my kids just to to put this in front of their eyes. Psalm 101 says, I will, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside and shall not cleave to me. I hate that. I hate the work of those that do iniquity. I hate the work that, of those that do abomination. I don't want it sticking to me at all. I want to have nothing to do with it. So I'm not going to put it in front of my eyes. But when you willfully put this junk in front of your face and in front of your kids' faces, guess what? It's going to stick. It's going to stick up here, and it's going to make them tolerant of abominations. Turn if you go to Romans 6, last place we're going to turn to, I'm closing in Romans 6. I'll start reading in verse number 1, Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin, that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin." This is the renewing. This is the attitude we need to have daily. This is the battle we need to continually to put off this old man. Look, that got, stuff got put away when Christ was nailed to the cross. When I, when I put my faith in Christ and he paid the punishment, I don't have nothing to do with that stuff. Um, that's not going to cleave to me. Let's not continue in sin just because we can. Because grace is going to abound. No! Let's, let's walk in newness of life. Newness. Not the oldness of this world. Not what this world has. Not being influenced by Satan. But being influenced by Jesus Christ. It's hard to walk. I'll tell you this. It's hard to walk in newness of life when you continually surround yourself with worldly influences. How do you expect yourself to be walking in a newness when you're doing everything that you were doing before you got saved? There is no newness there. You continue to pump yourself with all of the world's garbage. You will not be walking in newness of life. It's not going to happen. 
You have to cut off the things of this world from yourself in order to move in the right direction. You got to do it. God has a high standard for us. I mentioned that this morning, you know, and this sermon fits in perfectly with why we need to be in church and why we need to be in church more often and so much the more as you see the day approaching because we need godly influences when Satan continues to impact and influence this world more and more and more. And the more time you spend out there and the less time you spend in here, the more you're going to be influenced by the world. God's standard for us is perfection. That's what he demands of us. We are not perfect. We know this. God knows this, but his standard doesn't get lowered because we're not perfect. No, this is still a standard. God's a holy God. God wants a holy people. We can achieve that holiness through Jesus Christ and his holiness be imputed unto us. But while we're still in this flesh, let's hold ourselves to a high standard. Let's not let any of this garbage into our minds, whether, whether it be the Disney stuff or any of the world's garbage, any of the worldly influence. Let's, let's not allow that to impact our minds. Let's continue just to move forward in the right direction. The Bible says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. We're spending our time doing the things that God wants us to do. We won't have any time to get caught up in all this other nonsense anyways. We'll just be doing what's right all the time. That's the goal, right? We may not ever reach that goal while we still have this flesh, but that's the goal. That's what we're headed towards. That's, that is the mark. Be aware. Like I said, this isn't profound. This isn't necessarily any new knowledge for anybody in here. It's a reminder. Satan's subtle. The influences are going to be subtle. They, sometimes they become more obvious to us, especially as things get more and more wicked. And the more you can separate yourself from this world, the more you can do righteously, the more you're going to be uh, uh, in tune to see all of the various subtleties that are out there. I guarantee you there's a lot of things that you're blind to right now because we haven't separated ourselves enough. Yeah. And we're just, we're just not seeing how subtle some of this stuff really is that we're, we're continuing to allow into our home and into our minds. Let's be vigilant and sober. Sober means serious, and it also means you know, not drunken, right? Let's be sober about this. This is an important matter. What influences us? Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your instruction, for the clear words that you've given us, dear Lord. Would to God that more people would spend way more time in their Bibles and, and getting the uh, influence from you and the influence from your word into, into what's right and what's wrong. God, I pray that you would please help us and, and increase our wisdom and knowledge, dear Lord. Help us to identify the, the satanic influences that are around us and in this world, dear Lord, that we wouldn't um, fall prey to them, dear Lord, that we wouldn't get sucked in by the great illusion and by the big trap of, um, of our senses being tickled and, and while, while we're being um, brainwashed, dear Lord, I pray that you please help us to be resistant to these things and, and just increase our knowledge, increase our faith, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.